So good evening, everyone. It is really nice to be here with you all tonight. And I want to thank you for joining us in this virtual platform. I want to start by saying that we miss seeing all of you in person around the state. And I can't wait until we have the chance to be together again. Uh, my name is Sarah Gideon. I think you know that because you tuned in to be together tonight. But just as a reminder, I live here in Freeport and I'm filming from my own home with a husband, children, a dog and a cat. And the dog is feisty tonight. So if there's noise in the background, I hope you'll forgive me. I serve as Speaker of the Main House of Representatives. I'm in my fourth term in the Main House and my second term as Speaker, and I am running to represent all of us as Mainers in the United States Senate. Now, I know we are in this time that continues to be so challenging, and I want to say and remind all of us what I remind myself every day, that we are all in this together. And as challenging and difficult as coronavirus is and continues to be, we will get through this by continuing to lift each other up and continuing to help each other together. That being said, I'm really excited tonight to have a little bit of a different format for our virtual town hall. Tonight, we have a wonderful guest with us. Her name is Genevieve McDonald. She is a fellow representative in the main state house with me in the House of Representatives. She is also a lobster boat captain herself, and she lives on Deer Isle with her husband and two little girls. She's a very, very busy woman, so I'm really honored that she would take the time to be with us tonight. Because what I want to explore, and the reason I think many of you have tuned in tonight is to explore this issue also, is what is happening to our lobster industry right now? Now, as many of us know, there have been a number of challenges presented to our lobster industry and the men and women who are part of this fishing industry for years now. But with the advent of coronavirus, things have become even more challenging. Now, whether we're talking just about the economy, the fact that this is a $1 billion industry in this state, or whether we're talking about the fact that lobstering and, and fishing is something that is passed down through the generations and so much a part of the fabric of who we are here in Maine. We know that we have to take every effort possible to protect not just an industry, but the men and women who are a part of it and who make their living from it. It's really who we are as Mainers. So tonight, I'm looking forward to hearing from Genevieve about many, many of the issues and challenges that she and her fellow Blastermen face, but also the solutions that are out there. And I just want to start um, our discussion by talking really briefly about a couple of the proposals that I hope that we can see being brought forward. Because what I see as my job right now, both as Speaker of the Main House of Representatives, but as somebody running for U.S. Senate, is to make sure that we are continuing to meet people's needs and continuing to help people through this crisis, but also that as a candidate for U.S. Senate, I continue to bring the voices of people forward and to ask and ask and ask that the federal government meets our needs. Now, right now, there are a number of things that the federal government could be doing to help this, lo this lobster industry more. It absolutely includes getting that $300 million allocation from the CARES Act out to the people in the fishing industry. Right now, that money is still held up and we haven't seen it yet. And we're still waiting for details on exactly how it will be distributed. Beyond that, there is a way that we can ask our congressional delegation and the federal government to continue to think about how we actually give direct relief to people in the fishing industry. And we could definitely do this from with additional funds through the Commodity Credit Corporation. We should also think about how we can continue to expand the PPP, the personal, uh, the uh, protection uh, loans, but in a way that makes a focus on the lobster industry and on making sure that we are expanding these funds to be available for people who are self-employed. 
Um, I want to see also something that looks like a grant program for cities and municipalities to be able to use and that could be specifically tailored towards the lobster industry as well. These are just some of the ideas that I have and that I hope we can explore tonight. And without further ado, I am going to turn the screen over to my friend and a woman I admire very much, uh, Lobster Boat Captain and Representative Genevieve McDonald. Thank you, Sarah. It's very nice to see you, even though virtually, and thank you for inviting me to join you today. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the issues the industry is facing, but maybe a little bit of the history of the industry first. And so lobstering is not just the backbone of our economy in these coastal communities. It's also one of our heritage industries. It dates back to the days of salt cod and shipbuilding. And so it's really the cornerstone of our cultural identity. Um, and one of the things that are, we're so proud of in the lobster industry is our conservation measures. So our first fishermen initiated conservation measures went into place in 1874, and that was a size limit. And through the years, we've added additional conservation measures to assure that we have an abundant resource today. So we're very proud of that in the fishing industry. And it's something that's been carried on through generations from fishermen to fishermen and really is a big piece of our success. There's two things that really make the lobster industry successful. One of those is sustainability, and the other thing is diversity. So we have a very diverse fleet from you know, teenagers in 20-foot skiffs to 45-foot boats that are offshore and fish year-round and everything in between. So those are really you know, sort of the tenants that our fishery is based on. I'm gonna take a sip of water here real quick. Of course. So this is a very challenging time in the lobster industry. Restaurants are closed across the nation. Cruise lines are closed. Casinos are shuttered. These are all major markets for the lobster industry. Today, earlier today, I was scheduled to participate in a webinar to help discuss how fishermen and other sole proprietors can access the PPP loan and the economic injury disaster loan. And unfortunately, before our webinar was held, those funds um, have reached their limit. They've been exhausted. So increasing funding to the PPP would be extremely helpful for the lobster industry and additionally releasing the 300 million that was allocated through the CARES Act. So those are two things that right now we really need to happen because there's very limited pools of money for us to pull from. The market has essentially collapsed. Although I will say that we still have a fantastic product and there's still a demand for fresh seafood in home markets and home cooks, but that can't sustain us for the long term. So getting those programs up and running again and functioning would be extremely helpful right now. Um, thank you so much, Genevieve, for giving us a little uh, overview. Um, and I know that you were very judicious and, and there is so much more information that you could share with us. So I hope you don't mind, but I would love to just probe a little bit and ask you some more questions uh, to make sure that I understand the issue, but everybody else who's listening in also really understands uh, what's happening for folks. So I think that, you know, I wanna just ask you a little bit about beyond coronavirus. I mean, we know, as you said, that we have restaurants, for example, and hotels closed and shuttered, and a whole means of selling your product is now essentially closed down to you and to other fishermen as well. What are the actual ways in which people like me and other people who are on this call tonight can actually help support your industry right now? So the best way that you can support the industry right now is to continue purchasing seafood. And there's multiple avenues for this. This includes your grocery store, your local fish market. You can also purchase directly from boats. There are various groups set up on Facebook, on different social media channels um, that are helping fishermen learn how to sell directly to consumers. That's not something that we usually do because we are a high volume fishery. And so please keep buying seafood, American seafood, you know, and not just lobster, but fish and scallops and everything else that we have to offer as well. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And I know that Lobster 207 is one of those ways, but are there other specific marketing or direct, uh, you know, direct 
purchasing outlets that you can think of that we could share with people right now? Or should people just Google a way, you know? So you can just Google. I mean, I'm, and there's multiple hundreds of lobster dealers throughout the state. So I would just look to see who is closest in your area. If you're in the Stonington area, we have Greenhead Lobster, the Stonington Co-op, Coldwater Seafood. But anyone who lives near the coast or is willing to take a drive, a Google search should bring up your local fish market. Yeah, great. Um, Genevieve, beyond coronavirus itself, I know that there have been other challenges for the lobster industry for the past couple of years. And, you know, as we think about how we move through this pandemic and as we think about recovery, I think it is important for all of us to understand what some of those other issues are and if we expect them to still be in front of you as barriers. Could you talk a little bit about some of those? Yes, so there are pending rules in federal litigation about how the best way to move forward in protecting right whales. So the Maine lobster industry has had protections in place for the North Atlantic right whale since 1997. These have included um, eliminating floating rope on the surface, 600 pound breakaways, um, trawling up, so more traps on a line. This removed 30,000 miles of rope out of the water. Unfortunately, the one factor that we can't control is climate change. And so we are starting to see the effects of climate change on the Maine lobster industry and on the North Atlantic right whale in changing migration patterns. So right whales have been following Calanus, which is their primary food source, it's a plankton. And as their food source has shifted, they have shifted and this has brought them into waters where they typically were not previously seen in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, far offshore the Gulf of Maine into shipping channels and has created some very unfortunate, unusually high mortality events. And so moving forward, we are working on the best way to reduce the risk to the North Atlantic right whale while also preserving the lobster fishery. Yeah. So thank you for explaining that. And I think I just want to pause on that for one moment to say that you know, you gave a little bit of the history of some of the rules that have already taken place and the way that lobstermen in Maine have complied um, with rules in an effort to be good stewards. And I just want to stop and note that that is true and that I think that lobstermen in the state of Maine are particularly good stewards of the ocean and the, all the creatures that live there. And that as we think about these pending rules and litigation that's happening, that we make sure that we are basing everything on the science and data that's in front of us and that we are not putting lobstermen in a position with unnecessary burdens in front of them in order to complete their job and to keep right whales and other uh, sea creatures safe, but also that we are not putting lobstermen in danger in any way by doing this as well. And it's, I know, a very challenging situation and just wanna say that you know, we wanna be here with you continuing to work on it and to advocate for rules that really make sense uh, for all the things to consider. Just an additional question for you. I mean, I know at some point there were really some challenges around the trade and tariff wars, particularly with China and how that affects, affected uh, the lobster industry. What concerns do you have moving forward about that? Um, so I have deep concerns about that. We need all of the markets that we can get losing our Chinese market. It affected different businesses differently depending on how heavily they invested in that market, but especially during such an unstable time, we really need access to any markets that we can have overseas or otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so another thing for us to be making sure that we are vigilant about keeping yes. an eye on and it. We've also, you know, we also have trade relations with the EU that have been negatively impacted. So it's not just China. And mm -hmm. we really need to repair those relationships for all of our seafood, US seafood markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great. Genevieve, is there anything else, you know, in terms of what you are facing today um, or as we look at coming out of this pandemic that you want the rest of the population, those of us who love to eat lobster and who want to support you and make sure that the lobster industry is here for generations to come as it has been for generations before, is there anything else that you want us to know or think about? 
Um, I, want to, I want you to know that in 22 years that we've had right whale regulations, there has only been one confirmed entanglement in Maine and zero mortality events contributed to Maine waters. And so in this litigation, asking the Maine lobster industry to bear the full brunt of this burden while not taking account other factors that are contributing to this issue is unfair. And we're hoping moving forward to see a science-based process based on informed by best available science yeah best available science is, yeah, that that is available so we certainly do consider ourselves stewards of the sea we're out there every day we depend on it for our livelihood and our way of life and certainly want to move forward in the most responsible manner as possible so that we can continue to have this fishery for many generations to come yes well, I agree. And I just want to say thank you for all of the work that you do, whether it is out in the Gulf of Maine, whether it is in the State House in Augusta. And as I said earlier, I'm just a really, I'm just an admirer of yours and all that you do. Uh, so thanks a lot. And thanks for being with us tonight, Genevieve. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. And the same to you. So I hope to see you in person again soon sometime. Thanks. Okay, so for everyone who is with us tonight, I wish I could see all of your faces on the screen with me, but now we're going to transition into the next portion of our town hall. And I want to just mention that one of my favorite parts of this campaign has been our suppers with Sarah, where, as Tim mentioned a little bit earlier, we spent many, many a night in towns all around this state inviting all of you to come join us, where I was able to share a little bit about myself and why I'm running for the U.S. Senate, but more importantly, where you were able to ask me questions about where I stand on an issue and what I want to do as a U.S. Senator. So we're taking that portion of our suppers with Sarah and continuing the tradition of them as we do these virtual town halls. We're going to be transitioning now to a time where you can ask those questions. And so I'm going to just remind everyone what Tim told you earlier, that at the bottom of your screen there, if you bring your mouse down, there is a raise your hand icon. And if you click on that, we'll be able to see you. We will take as many questions as we can tonight. And I will just say, um, hopefully you're already raising your hands right now so that someone can appear with a question. But I'll just tell everyone, because it can be a little awkward, that sometimes it takes a couple of seconds for you to appear on the screen with me. And so we'll do our best to keep things flowing as quickly as possible through this process. Now, while we're waiting for our first question to come up, I just want to tell everyone one of the things that we're doing here on the campaign trail to help during the time of coronavirus. We have a part of our campaign called our field team who's normally out knocking on doors and making phone calls to people about the election. And right now they are making sure that every time they make a phone call, they're checking in with folks to see what's happening and if there is any connection to any resource that the person on the other end of the line needs. And we have found this to be really helpful in making sure that people who need to get to a doctor, who need to figure out how to connect to unemployment employment or anything else are able to do so. Okay, so I see that somebody named Claire uh, is on the screen with us. I can't see your picture, Claire. I don't know if you're able to start your audio, um, but just a reminder to definitely uh, make sure that you are not muted so you can ask me a question. Hi. I think you are muted, Claire. But yeah, uh, just a sec. There you go. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, you've spent a lot of time in State House, and I was wondering what of the things you've done there are you, what, what have you accomplished that you're most proud of? Oh, um, Claire, thank you for that question. I am proud of so much of the work that I've been able to do with my colleagues in the State House over eight years. But when I look back at this work and I think about some of the things that I have focused on with the greatest clarity, I am particularly proud of the work 
number one, around lifting people out of poverty and creating pathways for them to be able to continue to do better and better. Um, very specifically, we looked at the number of children and families that were living in deep poverty in the state of Maine and said, we have to do something about this. And so we were able to work in a bipartisan way on a series of legislation over the past three uh, terms that not only initially gave people a lift out of poverty, poverty, but then continued to connect them through education um, and wraparound services to be able to continue to stay out of poverty and have their own path to prosperity. We also have worked really hard on challenging and combating the opioid crisis. As we all know, we saw Maine be one of the states and people that were hardest hit by this crisis. As a matter of fact, I think that there is a time in the past decade where we could talk to anybody and always find that there was some way that we knew somebody who had been impacted by this tragedy. Um, we still have a ways to go, but we have been able to A, save hundreds of lives through the distribution and administration of naloxone when somebody is overdosing, but also to increase the amount of education and prevention and treatment available to people, not just in the short term, but in the long term as well. So uh, those are some of the things I'm most proud of. And I thank you for asking that question. Thank you for doing them. <laughs> So while we're waiting for our next question to come up, uh, oh, hello. It looks like you might be muted. I think I'm all set now. There we go. Hi, Steve. How are you? Oh, good. How are you, Sarah? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, I can see your name on the screen. I don't know if everybody else can, but would you mind just briefly introducing yourself and what town you are from? So uh, my name is Steve Bean. I'm a family physician with an office in Farmington, and I'm at home now in Jay. Wonderful. Well, nice to see you. Are you able to practice right now? How, what's happening? I, I know that you were here to ask me a question, but I am curious, are you practicing telehealth? Are you able to see patients in person? So the answer to both those questions is yes. I mean, business is way down but the office is open. I've been, I've committed myself to keeping everybody employed as long as I can and to serving our patients, uh, many of whom are in opiate treatment, actually referencing the last question. Yeah. So um, we're doing about half and half face-to-face -face visits and telehealth. Um, we are, you know, we've certainly changed the way we do things. Anybody with a respiratory illness is seen in the parking lot. We, and we gown and, you know, don all the protection that we can for those visits. So we keep the actual office space as safe as possible. We're essentially not using the waiting room. So people are, have their temperature tech checked when they come to the door and then they are brought right in. So we're trying to keep it as safe for people as possible. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. And, um, but I want to make sure that you have a chance to ask the question that you might have had in mind when you came sure. onto the screen here. Well, it's kind of amazing to me that even if we didn't have the pandemic, you know, uh, healthcare, you know, would be probably a top priority. It certainly was during the primary campaign. Mm -hmm. And now we have a pandemic which has blown up everything into the sharpest, most painful relief possible, not only the shortcomings of our immediate delivery system, but now we have to look at sort of the bigger picture of public health, public health infrastructure, national leadership. I heard today that we, over the last few years, we have let go 58,000 employees in our public health care system. Mm -hmm. um, the CDC, which is the model and envy of the world has essentially been silenced. And in the face of the biggest epidemic and health crisis in my lifetime, we don't even have national leadership. So this is all stuff that you might be walking into, Sarah, and I'm curious, you know, how would you respond and how do you keep yourself on your feet in the face of all these challenges? 
Yeah, so Steve, um, really important questions and questions that I ask myself every day about looking forward, but also that I think and reflect on our experiences even here in the state of Maine. You know, my fellow legislators and I over the course of the past month have frequently said to each other, can you imagine if this pandemic struck us here in the state of Maine just two years ago when we had no director of the CDC, that position was vacant for years, where our public health infrastructure here in the state had been virtually decimated, both through the Department of Health and Human Services and the CDC. And we're so, so thankful that we have this leadership in place since Governor Mills became governor and that she really prioritized rebuilding these departments. Now, as you just said, we are seeing on the federal level a very similar thing that has happened. We've seen, number one, that even though we have talked globally, as well as in this country, about the fact that a pandemic was eventually and probably soon going to be arriving on our shores, that we still weren't prepared for it. It's sort of unbelievable that that is the case, that we chose not to invest in a way that we were going to be prepared for it. And where we have an administration, a presidential administration and a president who has throughout this crisis refused to really acknowledge what's happening, whether it's listening to the World Health Organization and the warnings that were coming or whether it has been listening to people that he's surrounded by in his own administration about the seriousness of this crisis. You know, you talked about going out to the, when people come with respiratory issues and going outside to meet them and being properly, uh, you know, gowned, so to speak, having your gowns and presumably masks on. But what we know both in Maine and across this country is that access to personal protective equipment has been absent. And the only way for us to make sure that doctors, nurses, first responders, as well as other people working on the front line, that they can do their job is to have that personal protective equipment and that it simply must be coordinated in this mass scale way that we need it from the federal level. In fact, I believe that it is the only way for that supply chain to be actually implemented. Here in Maine, as Dr. Shaw said, we're trying to use an umbrella. I think he said an umbrella in a hurricane, right? We have approximately a little over 20% of the PPE that we asked for here for our doctors and nurses. And when we think about actually meeting this pandemic head on, when we think about overcoming it, when we think about being able to welcome people back out of their homes and into the economy and rebuilding the financial devastation that many people find themselves in, we cannot do it unless we have actually defeated the coronavirus to begin with. So um, this is of great concern. And I'll just touch on one more thing, which is that you know what you talked about in the beginning of your question was essentially the inequities that exist among us that have been laid absolutely bare by this pandemic and coronavirus. Whether it is access to healthcare and affordability of healthcare, whether it is having a home to be safe in when there is a stay at home order in place, um, whether it is the people who are still on the front lines working and working without the personal protective equipment that we were just talking about. And what we have to say to ourselves as we are coming out of this pandemic is that we can never just go back to the way it was, that we have to think about how we actually make sure that every person in this country has access to excellent and quality health care that they can afford, and how we make sure that when we rebuild this economy, we rebuild it with the idea that workers and individuals and families and small business owners need to be able to rebuild and be stable again. And that the idea that lobbyists and corporations can't just jump to the front of the line as they've been able to do in the past. Well, thank you for your leadership and thank you for your service. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for being here tonight.
So uh, I know we're going to be pulling another question up hopefully shortly. Just a reminder to please raise your hand at the bottom of the screen. And it looks like we have uh, Richard coming on board here soon, just waiting for his picture to appear. And hi, how are you? Richard, I think we still have you muted. Do you know how to unmute your own screen? Okay. Thanks. You got me now? Yes. Hi. Hi. Thanks for being here with us. Um, I, I, I joined slightly late. I had a problem getting the link and stuff. So you, you might have already talked about the, the, the whale issue as, 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 uh, as it has to do with lobstering or with Genevieve. My question was about that. And on, uh, but perhaps I can add a, a secondary thing. The original question was in the recent court rulings found, no, uh, the court found that NOAA was violated the Endangered Species Act with regards to right whales when it allowed lobstermen to place traps off Maine's coast. What do you view as the best way forward to both protect the right whales but won't unduly harm the lobster industry and the coastal economies. Yeah, so um, this is a fundamentally important question and I think it's a complicated one given that what we saw, the judge's ruling that we just saw the other day and the complexities of this. Now, I and many, many of my colleagues, including Genevieve, have been out front and very outspoken in saying that number one, we know and have seen, all of us, that lobstermen in this state have been excellent stewards of the ocean and further have worked very, very hard to comply with continued rules that have been put forward that are difficult for them and for their success in this industry. But nonetheless, they have done them time and time again. Now, we all, and the reason why lobstermen have been willing to do that is because of a belief in being a good steward and wanting to protect right whales and other species in the ocean. But now we're in this place knowing that lot, the lobster industry is essential to our economy and really, really under great duress for many reasons. And we also know that the proposed rules in front of us are not based on scientific evidence and data that we can see about the right whale's path through the Gulf of Maine. Now, in order to actually have rules that we would agree to and support, they would have to include that and have to be based on that data. Right now they're not. And what I will have done and will encourage is that unless we have an actual linkage between lobstering and how it is done here in the state of Maine and the deaths of those right whales. And as Genevieve pointed out, when we did discuss this briefly, Richard, only there has been only one death of a right whale, um, you know, in uh, recently that was uh, in the Gulf of Maine that we need to make sure that we are protecting the people in the lobstering industry and their livelihood. I, I would, uh, I, I, I didn't introduce myself before. I'm, I'm a ex-fisherman, a retired fisherman here mm -hmm. in Friendship, Maine. And I also uh, worked on the uh, Maine's Ocean Acidification Commission. Oh, and thank I, you spoke on climate behind you at the Augusta Climate March a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And part of, part of my concern with the, the whale issue is that we have an administration now that won't even allow those agencies that handle this case to, to mention the word climate change. And, and part of this whole problem to me is, is that the, the, the whales and many species in the ocean are, are under duress and, and, and threatened now because of, of warming waters and acidifying waters out there. The whales feed on zooplankton and these zooplankton in, in studies at Bigelow Labs right here in Maine are shown that they produce less lipids or they have less fat content with warm warming conditions and more acidific, more pH, uh, more pH and, acidified waters and things so um so what what that is is it's 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 giving these whales less of a food source 
and they're having to chase this food source up way up into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So, so as, as you stated, that, that this is a part, partly a science issue and a climate issue. And we have these agencies that can't, can't even openly, <laughs> seems like they can't even openly discuss it as such, which is a, a shame. Which is a real, yes, it's a, it's a real problem, Richard. And thank you very much for giving us a little more information about the science of that and the degree of rising temperature in the Gulf of Maine and the uh, associated acidification that comes with that. And um, I also just want to clarify something. I think I misspoke and said and referenced the death of a right whale, but it was actually uh, one entanglement only that has been noted of a right whale, not actually a death. So um, the the burdens on lobstermen and the fishing industry overall and the health of the Gulf of Maine overall are many, but do include, in fact, the effects of climate change upon us. And I think that Maine fishermen and all of us here in Maine are seeing that acutely. Thank you so much for joining us tonight yeah. and for bringing that issue forward. So while we're waiting for our next guest to appear on the screen, I just want to remind people around the state, you might already know this, but we're actually uh, really in need of people to donate blood. So if you are able to do that uh, and wanna get in touch with the American Red Cross, it is a vitally important need right now in the state of Maine. Okay, so hello, good evening. Uh, ben, yep, you're unmuted now. If you can just remind us where you are from and your full name, it's nice to see you. Thanks, it's good to see you too. Uh, my name is Ben Conniff. I'm from Portland. Um, I work at Luke's Lobster, so I'm in a lot of different areas of the lobster industry. Yeah. And um, what I've been wondering in this conversation, I'm a huge environmentalist. I imagine Richard is also. I imagine you are also. And so it's been very odd for me to see organizations that I've always supported and believed in be so squarely in the wrong on the right whale issue. Um, so I'm curious as a as a politician, what's it like to have to go against people that might typically be your allies when they kind of veer off course on, on issues like this. Yeah, and what a thoughtful question. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because it is challenging and I have not often, if ever, found myself in a different position uh, than, for example, uh, one of the people uh, who brought forward the Lawsuit Conservation Law Foundation. In fact, we have worked very closely together thinking about renewable energy policy, for example. Look, I think that we all know there are no issues that are simple. There is always a lot of complexity that, that you know, is included in thinking about any issue. I found that even in thinking about the renewable energy issues that I just mentioned, but particularly, I think in this instance, what I try to do, whether I am working with another lawmaker or whether I am working with others who are concerned and part of policy making is to identify what their concern is. I think in this case, their concern is the preservation of the right whale. And I think the thing that I recognized immediately in this from talking not only to that community of people, but to lobstermen and all of the people associated with the lobster industry was that the care about the right whale was something that everybody agreed with. And in fact, that was the reason why, and I was really amazed to learn about all of the steps along the way and over years that lobstermen in Maine have specifically and and really um, willfully taken to help protect the right whale. And that yet when we came and saw, rather, when we saw these rules come along and when we saw the, um, I'm gonna use the word severity of them for lack of a better word, and the implications on especially lobstermen and boat captains who have smaller boats and smaller crews or who are out there by themselves, 
the devastation that that would bring to the industry without really being able to show that there was a linkage between the way we're fishing now and what's happening to the right whales, uh, you know, it, it just didn't make sense to me. That's why I came down on that side of the issue. I always like to believe that everybody is approaching something with the best of intentions, but sometimes we find ourselves in different places and that's why it's really, really important to continue to talk about those issues and to demand that if there is science and data behind it, please bring it forward so we can all understand it. But so far, we just haven't seen that. Thanks, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so as we wait, uh, and a reminder to please raise your hand at the bottom of the screen, uh, I just want to say thank you to all of the people out there who are working on the front lines, and I think it probably feels like a battlefield for nurses and doctors and first responders all around the state. But I also just want to recognize the other people who are on the front lines working in our grocery stores and gas stations and pharmacies every day showing up to work, putting your own health at risk to be there for everyone else. And we see you and we hear you and we thank you. Okay, I see that we have another guest joining us on the screen. I can't see your name right now, but I am looking forward to hearing your question if you would introduce yourself. Okay, um, my name's Kendall Ziegler. I'm a retired teacher in Eastport, Maine, way, way up here in Washington County, which I want to say thank you for actually coming up here. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Um, my question is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it shouldn't take a pandemic to show the lack of leadership in Washington. How will you change this? Yes. Um, Kendall, thank you for joining us tonight. And I love coming to Washington, beautiful Washington County. So thank you for always being welcoming. Yes, I think we have seen a real lack of leadership and it has affected all of us in a way now that is so acutely felt, whether it is anxiety about our health, whether it is the actual numbers of people who are getting sick and people who are dying because of this pandemic, or whether it is the way that it has now affected our economy as well. You know, I was listening to a new segment this morning and the person said this so clearly and perfectly succinctly. If as a country, we had had testing in place, widespread universal testing in place, we would have been in a very different position in terms of how this virus spread and therefore what we also needed to do in terms of stay at home orders and closing uh, you know, businesses and, and the economy to the degree we have. And that is an easy thing for us to look at and identify and shake our heads at right now. But the truth is that this lack of leadership is coming and has been in front of us for years now. I think about some of the actions that we could be taking on the federal level that people in Maine have been asking for for years and for decades. For example, how we lower the cost of prescription drugs. And I think about the fact that there are these easy to identify ways that we could be doing that for example, with Medicare, we could actually allow the Medicare program or the federal government to negotiate with drug companies directly for lower drug costs. This is one of the most sensible and easy to do things. And yet somehow we have it written into the law that we're forbidden or prohibited from doing that. We've got to make changes like this. We've got to make sure that anybody who wants to buy into Medicare can do so and start to change what healthcare in this country looks like because nobody should be making the terrible choices that people in Maine and around this country make today about whether they're going to pay their rent or their mortgage or whether they're going to see a doctor when they need one. So that's the kind of leadership that I want to bring to the United States Senate and whether it's working on health care, whether it is storming into the United States Senate, knowing that climate change is an absolute emergency and crisis that needs bold and immediate action. That is what people can expect from me as their U.S. Senator. 
Oh, I'm so looking forward. <laughs> Thank you, Kendall. Thanks for being with us tonight. You're welcome. So I think we still have time for a couple more questions. It looks like another person is about to come up on the screen, but I thought I would just share with you some of a uh, little more about what the amazing staff on our campaign on Team Gideon has been doing uh, since they've been working from home and by themselves. They've still been working hard to volunteer. I know many of them have been out as I mentioned, we have a need for donating blood. They've been out donating blood themselves, uh, working at Pebble Street to help distribute food, buying groceries for their neighbors in need. And that's something I have been doing as well, trying to make sure that people in my community have access to food when they need it. So I know that's something that all of us can do in our different communities. Okay, good evening. How are you? I'm well. I just realized I was muted. Can you hear me? Yes, you are unmuted. We can hear you. Hi. Hi. And I'm not wearing a fur. This is my cat. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, my name is Deb, and I'm calling from Sebec. I was at your Dover Foxcroft uh, dinner with Sarah. It was lovely. Mm -hmm. um, my question, and I, I work at the small hospital up here in Dover Foxcroft. It's just a small 25-bed hospital. Mm -hmm. But my daughter-in-law works at Maine Medical Center. Yep. And I know you spoke to the issue of PPE earlier. But yes. I guess my question is, why is the federal government sending inadequate amounts of PPE to Maine and making it so challenging for Maine to obtain what we need? Yes. Um, Deb, first of all, I just want to recognize that your hospital there uh, in the greater Dover Foxcroft area, I know is such an important hospital. It might be small, but it is vitally important for access to health care and also as a, a, a a job producer as well. Um, and I want to just mention that rural hospitals in Maine today and across America today are really, really struggling and particularly in light of the coronavirus where elective procedures have been put on hold. And it's something that we're acutely aware of and uh, doing our best to work on and to help with. Now, going back to the subject of PPEs, whether it is around rural hospitals, our larger hospitals, or any healthcare providers in the state, there is simply no excuse. There is no excuse for the lack of PPE, but there is a reason for it. The reason is that the federal government and the Trump administration has not taken on the responsibility and the leadership role that they must in order to make sure, number one, that PPE is produced in adequate quantities to be spread around this country and to every state, and number two, to make sure that that supply chain is coordinated so the PPE can be out and, distri and distributed. We, it is, it is almost unbelievable that we have watched this unfold for months and that we have seen the president fool around with the idea of the Defense Pro Production Act and yet never invoke and then implement it in a way that actually created that supply chain. Now, what we know is that both Senator Angus King and Congresswoman Shelley Pingree with two different bills in the Senate and the House have been thinking about how Congress can actually act to force this to happen. And I look forward to Congress coming back into session so that Senator King and Congresswoman Pingree and hopefully the rest of our delegation will do what the Trump administration has failed to do because there is no way that in good conscience we can ask our doctors, our nurses, and our first responders to be treating people with coronavirus and putting their own lives at risk. But further, there is no way that we will actually defeat this pandemic if those people themselves are getting sick treating others. It's that simple. Thank you. It is. Thanks, Sam. And thanks for joining us. Sure. <laughs> All right, everyone, we have time for a couple more questions here. So uh, a reminder, you can raise your uh, hand at the bottom of the screen. And while we're waiting for the next person to come up, I just want to thank everyone who is showing such patience 
following the guidance of Dr. Shaw from the CDC and Governor Mills. I know it is very challenging in this time to um, continue to be at home. And um, just wanna say again, we're in this together. Hello, I see Charlie Beck on screen with us. Hi, Sarah, thanks so much for taking my question. Yeah, I'm Charlie, I live here in Portland. Um, I just first wanted to say thank you um, and also uh, Representative McDonald for working so quickly to bring everybody together, Democrats, Democrats and Republicans uh, here in Maine to address the virus. It's not really something we're seeing down in Washington. Um, I mean, it's, we're in a recess right now, but when there's a pandemic going on, people didn't really want to come together and do that. And we're already out of funding for the PPP. Um, why do you think it's taking Washington so long right now to get work done and also just in general? They tend to drag their feet. Yeah. Um, Charlie, thanks for that question. You know, I just want to touch briefly on um, something you said, which was the way that we worked here in Maine when coronavirus really descended, it felt like a tidal wave. We had been watching it around the world. We had been watching it arrive, but all of a sudden um, the numbers were just blowing up here in this country. And we felt that we were under a tremendous amount of pressure to A, try to look ahead and identify what the needs of Mainers were going to be and how we could think about them in, in advance and provide the the resources, um, both around unemployment and access to unemployment benefits, around access to health care, making sure that we had money in reserves and money that Governor Mills could use for the COVID-19 emergency. And then, of course, actually closing down an enormous set of buildings where hundreds and hundreds of people from every part of the state would come and congregate in a way that felt very, very unsafe in terms of our own responsibility to reduce spread. I was really proud of doing that. And the reason why I wanted to just pause on it for a moment is because we saw how things should work. We saw Democrats, independents, and Republicans come together swiftly to say, we're in a crisis. We know that people are going to be in need and we've got to manage and address those needs. Now, I think the good news is that looking backwards, we've seen Congress get their work done. It was a struggle for them to get the third package passed, um, but they were able to complete it, but their work is not finished. And that's where your question becomes critically important because we're continuing to see, I think the number today was more than 22 million Americans who have filed for unemployment. We've also seen that the PPP loans, uh, the um, amount of money allocated for those has run out. And so now Democrats and Republicans have to come together and say, there are needs that have to be met. Number one, we want to continue to deal with and help the small businesses, especially in a state like Maine, who are the backbones of our economy. But the question I would pose to those lawmakers is, how can we make that program better and stronger to meet the needs of those small businesses and the workers that they employ, or to meet the needs, for example, of somebody like Genevieve McDonald and the other uh, lobstermen and people in the fishing or farming industry that she might work work with. Um, I think we need to think about how we continue to give aid to the states and how we make it easy for them to access that aid, how we continue to make sure that we're keeping our hospitals, but especially our rural hospitals who are operating on the thinnest of margins, solvent, so that they can not only be here throughout this crisis to treat people, but survive into the future. These are not Republican problems or Democratic problems. They're problems for all of America. And it is time for those Democrats and Republicans to come together and say, these are all the needs we need to meet. And we're gonna be back again and again and again until we get it done. That's what you can count on from me in the United States Senate. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. So I think we probably have one more question looking at the time uh, in front of us. If there is one more question, I think Tim will uh, call on, on you. And it looks like we've got Clint coming online here with us. 
I just, while we have Clint coming online, I want to give a little shout out to my son, Alec, who's been here helping uh, us film tonight and get everything up and running according to speed. Hi, Clint, how are you? I'm well, oh. bro. Wanted you to see my t-shirt. Nice. <laughs> Lobster. Love, love it. <laughs> Um, Clint, you uh, said you're from Waldeboro because you were muted when you first came on. Yeah, you... I'm from Waldeboro, Maine. Yeah, okay. Great. down here in the mid coast. Uh, I sort of have it's it's like a twofold question, maybe. Uh, I'm kind of curious. How do you think the federal government can support the lobster and fishing industries during this crisis? And secondly. What more needs to be done to make sure that they or we can make it through the other side? Yes. Um, well, Clint, this is, I think, an excellent um, last question for us tonight because it brings us right back to where we started, which is to really focus on the challenges in front of the lobster industry right now. I don't know if you were able to be on for the whole time, but some of yes, the questions- Yes, I was, yeah. Yeah, great. So some of the questions I asked Genevieve were, you know, number one, what's happening right now for people who work in the lobster industry, but also a little background so that everybody on this call tonight understands that even before coronavirus, there were some real challenges that had been presented to people who make their living in this industry and that we've got to make sure that we are focusing on and thinking about how we help people who are part of an industry that is our heritage, as well as incredibly important to our economy. I cannot imagine our economy without the lobster industry. So first of all, I think it is essential that we take the $300 million that has was allocated as part of the CARES package and actually get it out to people in the fishing industry across this country. But I will be honest with you, we haven't seen the parameters around how that is supposed to be distributed, but I think we all know that it is not enough. There needs to be more direct relief that is given to lobstermen. And I think that there are a couple of ways in which we can do it both in the short term and in the long term. The first thing is we have seen in our country giving support to farmers in a way with direct relief packages. And I think that we need to do this going even beyond what we did with the CARES package. We could look at the Commodity Credit Corporation and think about how we're able to extract money for direct relief in that way. I think that as we look at replenishing the payroll protection loans that are that are out there and that have run out of money, that we need to do it in a way that we're restructuring it so that those can also be available to lobstermen, as well as thinking about are there ways that we help, for example, with vessel payments during this time of duress. We've talked about, you know, uh, what you know, uh, issues that people have, for example, with paying mortgages or paying rent. But I think the same thing goes for somebody whose livelihood is tied to their actual fishing vessel. I think on top of that, there are creative ideas that could include grants that are given to municipalities and uh, cities here in Maine. Right now, we've seen some sorts of grants um, and programs be part of previous packages but none of them are applicable towards cities and towns that are as small as the ones that we have in Maine. And we all know that when we do it locally, we do it best. Why not create a grant program that allows our towns to look, for example, at what the needs of lobstermen are and to be able to specifically create programs to help through this time, both as a short-term mechanism, but also a bridge into the future. So these are just some of my ideas. I am really open to other ideas, and I think that we need to keep talking about them and raising our voices together so that people in federal government listen and make a difference. We have to support the lobster industry. We have to support all of you who are in it. We won't make it through together unless we do that. I, th I thank you so much, and uh, it's, it's quite an endeavor you're taking on here. And uh, and uh, also, uh, uh, kudos to Genevieve. She's been uh, quite helpful for all the lobsters. 
Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clint. I really appreciate it. And that was the last question that we have time for, Sarah. Okay. Well, Tim, thank you for moderating and helping us grab all of these questions and bring people up on the screen. I have to say, as I said in the beginning, I truly miss seeing you all, being in person together, having the opportunity to look each other in the eye, to shake hands, to hug, but at least we get to see each other on the screen and interact a little bit. We're going to keep doing these virtual town halls as frequently as we can, and we're going to keep trying to make sure that we keep it interesting for all of you out there across Maine, and we keep bringing forward the challenges that are in front of us and the voices that need to be lifted up. I want to thank you again for everything that you are all doing as individuals and in your communities. We will get through this together and we are going to come out of it even stronger. Thanks so much and have a good night and take care. <laughs>